Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, like Drew said, I'm here to talk to you guys about the boating use patterns of the coral reefs uh, uh, on the coral reefs in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And for those of you who aren't intimately familiar with the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, it's located in, s in South Florida. Um, really, it is the water surrounding the island chain of the Florida Keys. And I want to see if my pointer works. How did you say? Middle button. There, I got it. Okay. So we're talking about, today we want to talk to you specifically about the coral reefs, which are really the pride and joy of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. We have the number one barrier reef in the, uh, in the United States. And along with that, we also have a nearshore patch reef that is in between that barrier reef system and the land right here. And both of those uh, coral reef systems are extremely important, not only for the animals that live on the coral reef, but also for the economy of the Florida Keys. Um, the sanctuary has a really invested interest in protecting these coral reefs, and one of the steps that they have taken is that they have created these sanctuary preservation areas that I'm going to refer to as spas for the rest of the day. And you will see here that they are um, these little blue boxes. They look really tiny on the map. But these boxes really function as no fishing zones. Um, and they were created by the sanctuary in the interest of protecting those coral reefs a little bit better. We, um, st I started out, I work for the state of Florida, but the sanctuary asked us to um, look at how people are utilizing the resources that are all throughout the sanctuary. But like I said, in the interest of time today, we're only going to be talking about the boating patterns that are ha and, and the activities that those boats are participating in. Um, only those that are above the coral reef habitat. And to do that, we did an aerial survey. And um, even though I would have liked to have been in the nice NOAA plane that's really large over here all the time, we're usually in the, the little Cessna 172s, which are not quite as comfortable. But we would go in those planes, um, leaving from Marathon, Florida, where I live and work. And we would go all the way up towards Miami. Uh, this purple line is our flight path. We would fly up to Miami, uh, looking at these near shore patches along the way. And then we turn around and follow the uh, barrier reef all the way down towards Key West. And then we come back up and we go back to Marathon, looking at those lower keys near shore patches along the way. We did this um, for the purpose of this study. We did it 24 times. And we did this all throughout 2016 and early 2017. And the, the plan was all uh, stratified through weekends and weekdays and summer and winter. But we're not going to talk about that today. Instead, we're going to talk about the, um, about the ways that we did this. Now, there were a wide range of activities that occur on the coral reefs. But today, again, in the interest of time, we're going to talk about recreational fishing, which we're defining as fishing with a rod and reel, um, and then diving, which I'm defining as dive boats that have a dive flag displayed or swimmers in the water. To uh, record all of this data, we went the super archaic method of pencil and paper. And this is one of those um, things that I could really use some help on. Um, we are counting potentially uh, tens of boats in each one of these one meter or one minute grids that you see here. Um, I only have a couple of seconds to write down the data for each boat that I'm seeing. So uh, we would we would use these uh, data sheets. We would have about 30 of them for each flight. And uh, we would write down the types of boats that we were seeing in each one of these little grids. And we would use a GPS, so we're not completely archaic. But we would use a GPS and the landmarks that you see here to see, uh, mark down any boats that we would see within, a three, mile, um, in, within three miles of our, our plane. Um, and we do have those spas that I was talking about. We do have those marked on the uh, grids as well. And um, in real life, those spas are delineated with big yellow mooring buoys. And we could see those from the plane. And we could decide if, pl uh, if boats were inside of the spa or if they were outside of the spa. Throughout those 24 flights, and only on the grids that contain coral reefs, um, we saw about 13,000 uh, vessels. Um, a third of those vessels were fishing at the time that we saw them. And a little more than a third of those vessels were diving. You may ask, well, what happened to the other third? And 
for the most part, they were actually moving at the time that we saw them, so we can't actually record any kind of fishing or diving activity for them. But when we plot all of this on a map, um, just looking at the average number of fishing vessels on a coral reef, um, you'll see these same one-minute grids that we recorded the data into. And um, I want to show you. So there's, this is, these are just boats that are fishing. And there's not really, these vessels are dispersed all throughout the coral reef. You're not really seeing any areas where they are concentrated. And for the most part, I mean, the, there's not very many boats in any of these grids. There's not any more than three in any one of these grids on average. Of course, sometimes there's more than three. But um, the pattern here is that there's a large area, a, di a large dispersion of the boats. Um, you'll also notice, so I have my little blue boxes here, which are my spas. There's supposed to be no fishing zones, but then you see this really big one over here. This is the Western Sambos Ecological Reserve. Um, it's one of our bigger spas. And uh, um, this just kind of shows you that there is poaching inside of some of these spas, especially the larger ones but it's not a common thing. It, just, it does happen sometimes. And if we look at it when we just are looking at diving vessels, um, you'll see that it does show up as orange because it has a lot more diving vessels than it has fishing pressure. Um, for this diving vessel map, my legend is a little bit different. It's where the darker colors are, um, they're showing up 10 to 20 boats, basically. So there's a lot more boats. And you're like, well, I don't, I don't see any boats here. There's nobody there. But there are more fish, uh, diving vessels than there are fishing vessels. But if we take a closer look at some of those spas that I was telling you guys about, these areas, which are diving only areas, are some of the only areas where diving is occurring. So it's interesting that by, pr by creating these protected areas, um, the sanctuary has kind of concentrated the diving pressure to only, with, to only be within these spas. Um, we also did an analysis to look at, well, which areas are uh, more popular for fishing versus diving. So really comparing those pressures against each other. And what's interesting is that uh, if you look at the Key Largo area up here, the upper keys, um, a lot of that area is sort of pink or red. So there's a lot more diving pressure in that area. And uh, as it will be, there's more dive operators in that area than there are anywhere else in the lower key, uh, middle or lower keys. Um, in the middle and lower keys, uh, Marathon claims to be like the family fishing capital of the world or something. And so you see a lot more um, fishing pressure there and in the, in the um, lower keys. You'll also see if we were to zoom in again to, the, to those spas that those are exclusively diving zones. So no surprise there. Um, but I also wanted to point out that there are some areas that are of mixed use. And so all of this is really interesting to the sanctuary when they're thinking about protecting more areas. They want to know who they're displacing if they decide to say that an area is no fishing or no diving or something like that. Lastly, I wanted to talk about this next project that I have going on, looking at those same boating patterns that I was just showing you and, and taking in different variables like distance from access points and benthic habitat and bathymetry and putting all of that into a regression and seeing if there's any sort of model that comes out of it. And unfortunately, I don't have anything for you because uh, I ran out of time um, with the hurricane and everything. And even though I've ran the, ran the regressions, I'm not getting the kinds of, um, not getting the kind of correlation that I thought I would get. So I'm going to need more variables. And this is where, if you guys have any ideas, if you happen to be really good at modeling or spatial uh, analysts, um, I would love to talk to you after this because I don't really have anybody to talk about with it, um, about for all this stuff in my office. So um, with that, if you don't get to talk to me after today, um, here's my information. And that's all I have for you. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you.